And I really believe, I believe that we can change ourselves, we can change families, we can change neighborhoods, we can change cities, we can change regions, we can change nations, we can change, there is no limit to what we can do if we will pay the price to number one, you've got to pay the price. Listen, it's going to cost you everything. I'm going to tell you the truth. And it's, you, you can't pray nice little prayers, and you just can't take on assignments because you think they're nice little assignments. You have to be told by God to do certain things, that there are certain things you don't take on, but when you take them on at his direction, you can guarantee the fact that you'll win the battle. I can tell you story after story. Of, of what we did, uh, of, of things that we've done. Let me just give you a few so that you do know that I know what I'm talking about. You've got you've to know how to really pray. You've got to know how to pray to get a hold of God in that breaker dimension and literally get in the glory realm where, where God will do anything. I mean, I've seen miracle after miracle after miracle because of, of what that woman taught me and how she taught me to get a hold of God. And, and you've got to know the word. I, I love, I, I still love Kenneth Hagin's book, The Believer's Authority. You know, in other words, what is our authority that, that, that Adam gave the authority to the devil, but you and I are called to enforce Christ's victory you know, on the cross and the resurrection, and you and I have authority to take back everything the devil's stolen. Let me say that again, everything the devil's stolen. So you've got to know your authority, and, and, and I love that book, and, and you've got to understand prayer. People, you know, different people pray different ways, but I know what it takes for me. Uh, I, I remember, uh, oh, I don't know, it was about eight years ago, maybe 10 years ago, and I was coming back from leading a prayer directive in the city of Detroit, and I got a call from one of the men in our congregation, and his wife was, at, they'd just gotten the news, she had the worst kind of leukemia you could have, and she was dying, and the, the doctors had just told, told him that her time was limited, and uh, he said, can you come? And I said, yes, I'll come. And But as I sat there, the Lord said to me, don't let her die. He said, don't let her die. So I knew that, th that I was going to have to follow the Lord and do what he told me to do, to literally turn around her sickness and disease to where she was healthy again. I mean, she had the worst kind, it's the kind of leukemia that takes you out within a very short period of time. And we prayed two hours a week. It, it always ended up two hours. Not that we said we're going to pray two hours, but we knew we were done. Every time we prayed, the Lord said, okay, now go to the hospital, lay hands on him and tell I mean, lay hands on her and tell her what she's supposed to do. The first time, it was, it was wake up. And we'd always finish about 9.30 at night. I'd go to the hospital, lay my hands on her, and tell her to wake up. So, so she woke up and was able to get off the ventilator, off of the, all the stuff. You know, you know what I'm talking about. So then uh, she still was... Not hadn't gotten beyond that, so we prayed again. Uh, for two, it, it happened to be two hours, and then at the end of two hours, God told me exactly what to do. I went to the hospital again, and and this time I said, "You'll begin eating and drinking, and you'll begin moving about." I just said it over her body. So so she started eating and drinking. Then she and all that and moving about. Then she didn't get any further than that. So we prayed again the next week. And it ended up two hours. In that two hours, and, and then at the end, the Lord said, Go, go to the hospital, tell her that she's to get up, walk around, and begin to get dressed every day, something like that. So I went back, I, I just laid my hands on her. 
I didn't spend time with her. I said, I'm here to give you a message. Do this. The authority is there to do it. You'll be able to do it. Guess what? She did it. And then, and then, but she still, they still wouldn't let her out of the hospital. So we prayed the next week. This is the fourth time. Fourth time, the Lord said, go and tell her when we finished praying. Two hours again. Can you believe it? Too? It was like we planned it, but we had, we were finished. You know, when you're finished praying something through and we prayed it through and he said, now go to her and tell her she's going to be released from the hospital tomorrow. We had no authority. We didn't know what the doctors were going to do. But I went, and I laid my hands on her, and I said, tomorrow you're going to get your release papers. She walked out of the hospital. I And I'm going to start in verse 15, Isaiah 22, verse 15. I'm reading from the Passion Translation. It says, this is what the Lord Yahweh, the commander of angel armies, has to say. Go to Shebna, the treasurer of the palace, and say to him, what right do you have to be here? (laughs) Will and I are already giggling. (laughs) And who gave you permission? And why do you chisel out a tomb for yourself here, carving out your royal burial place, a dwelling place in the rock? Watch out, O strong man. For the Lord is about to seize you and hurl you down. He will sling you around and around and throw you like a ball into a distant barren land. There you will die. And your splendid chariots will lie there in the dust. You are a disgrace to your master's house. I will kick you out of office and pull you down from your high position. Wow. Let's just keep reading. On that day, I will appoint my servant, Eliakim. How many of you know what Eliakim means? Do you know what it means? It means raised up by God. And and he was the son of Hilkiah, which means my portion is Yahweh. So I'm going to read that again. On that day, I will appoint my servant raised, raised up by God, who is the son of my portion is Yahweh. And I will honor him by clothing him with your robe and binding your priestly sash upon him. I will transfer your authority into his hands, and he will be a father to those living in Jerusalem and to the people of Judah. I will place upon his shoulders the key to the treasures of David, the house of David. He will open doors that no one can shut, and he will shut doors that no one can open. But we are in a season, we are in a year of 2020 of reset. Now, how many of you know what reset means? When you reset something, it literally means, you know like the Etch-A-Sketch? You're going to take an Etch-A-Sketch and you're going to shake it and it's going to be clean slate and you're going to start moving forward. Or think about, let's put it in technological terms, that you get a new cell phone and what happens? Everything has to be transferred or you got to reboot when you get an update, right? (laughs) Whether you want to or not, your little cell phone is going to reboot when it updates into the new. Not only that, but reset is a military term. See, when we're reading Isaiah 22, 22, this is governmental authority. This is legislative authority. This is authority where you can legislate and that David was given, where he can legislate, where we are given as the children of God, where we can legislate in authority and governmentally on behalf of the kingdom of God when he gives us the assignment to do it. Reset 
is a military term. And it literally means, this reset, that it's the preparation of a military unit. It's used in the U.S. military. And it literally means they're refurbishing and they're preparing all that they will use in the battle. They're preparing it. Not only are they preparing it, they're preparing it for the future mission of victory. So we're in a double portion 2020 year of reset. 20 was the age when young men would go in to fight in the military for Israel and go to battle. So here we are, <laughs> Isaiah 22, 22, 222 in 2020. <laughs> 